We have only one cat on, on screen here, and he's kind of sleepy, so he's not going to do a lot of... Uh... Okay, that was, that was not bad. Yes, on cue. De decent, yeah. Um, but a little too dark for the camera to pick him up super well here. But um, Okay, so <clears throat> there's a new piece of research. It's not impressive, but the topic is an interesting one. So uh, I, I didn't want to have spent so much time sort of like leading up to this because it's really not a great paper. <laughs> and there's another paper that it references that's even a worse paper, but that has such a great conclusion. I just, I'm, I'm gonna talk us through in both of their cases why the methods are kind of ridiculous. And so we don't know what we know. Like we don't know that we know what they think we know now, uh, but, but still the topic is basically one of what do any of those kinds of individuals that we speak to who don't have the same linguistic capacity that we do understand of us? And so there is, you know, in, in this area of research, there are various acronyms, of course, because you got to, once you have an area of research, you got to start with creating the acronyms so as to, you know, sort of gatekeep, keep people out. But you have like infant directed speech. Like, how does infant directed speech d differ from adult directed speech? I would never let an infant direct a speech. How does dog directed speech <laughs> differ from adult directed speech? How does cat directed speech? These are speech? directed at then. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Um, and this, there's a lot of research, of course, on infant directed speech. And, you know, everyone who's been a parent has noticed that they do or do not. Like, we, we didn't modulate our speech nearly as much as most people do when our kids were very, very young. Um, and I think we probably do much more for our, our animals. animals. Yes, yeah. for our non-human animals than we did for our, our human animals when they were very young. Uh, and... And yet, we know, for instance, that uh, from historical work, speech directed at companion animals shares aspects of speech directed at infants, specifically, specifically with regard to hyperarticulation, right? Shorter utterances, more repetitions, elevated pitch, and increased pitch variation. Okay, so all of those things you will recognize if you have ever had a baby or a dog or a cat or, you know, even a fish if you're that kind of person, but probably you don't talk to your fish that way. Some people might. Um, but again, hyperarticulation, shorter utterances, more repetitions, elevated pitch, and increased pitch variation, all are things that have been noted as being true facts. <laughs> <laughs> True facts about the companion animal. Yes. A reference that no one will get except for Toby if he's watching. <laughs> <laughs> so what is that reference to? Uh, Z. Frank. Z. Frank in a video called True Facts About the Leader. Oh, there are a lot of True Facts videos. <laughs> it's been a long day already. Okay. Um, so... Th that those those things that are true of the way that people talk when they're talking to babies in particular and to some degree to companion animals um, has been supported by a lot of actually good research. Um, the research just came out last month in the journal uh, Animal Cognition. Uh, it's got three authors, de Mouzon, de Mouzon, Gontier, and Laboucher. They're French. Uh, and it's called Discrimination of Cat-Directed Speech from Human-Directed Speech in a Population of Indoor Companion Cats. So the question is, um, can, can cats distinguish between speech that's directed at them <clears throat> versus speech that is not directed at them? Mm. And this is a question that you feel somewhat strongly about. Yes, for the record, <laughs> my position is that cats don't even know their names and anything beyond that is wasted. Okay, but but knowing your name may be a different and like lateral question to do you know you're being spoken to? Okay, and I, okay, I agree right? that there's something interesting here, especially in light of the fact, which I believe is a fact, that uh, domestic cats that are vocal are vocal with their people, but they are not vocal with each other in the absence of people. And I think, hypothesis, they're not going to be vocal with strangers the same way. They're going to be vocal with their people. They don't do not. a lot of cat calling. <laughs> Sorry. I think, yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Um, so, also from just past research, which is two more interesting things that I, th I didn't 
pursue all of the different pieces of research and to assess how good they were. Um, but two other results, not from this research that just came out in the Animal Cognition last month, are that people raise the pitch of their voices more when talking to puppies than talking to adult, adult dogs. So the, like, I'm talking to a youngin thing gets added to itself when you're talking to a puppy who doesn't yet know versus a dog who kind of does, okay? And um, also, people modulate their pitch more when talking to dogs than to cats, okay? Mm. As, as if, and this isn't to say necessarily that that's apt, but as if the people at least imagine that the, that the, the dog may be interpreting more accurately than the cat does. Like you wouldn't modulate your pitch. Either you would think that the cat can understand you completely, right. which is then you 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 got some issues to work out, or you don't think the cat's understanding you at all, in which case you don't modulate your pitch really, but you will modulate your pitch for your dog, which you imagine could understand you partially, but not fully, just like you would do if you were talking to a baby. All right. Two, two observations. One, you could interpret that either way, right? You could. Either people... Uh, and I don't think this is true, but either people uh, imagine their cats are more comprehending and the dog needs the exaggerated pitch to get yeah. it. Yeah, talking to a cat is more like talking to a 12-year-old and talking to a dog is more like talking to a 2-year-old. Not so much. Yeah. yeah. Uh, talking to a cat is more like talking to a tree. I was going to say a sponge. <laughs> right. I, I don't, and I don't mean that at right. all. Like, I, I actually, I'm, I, I fall on the other side of this, but... Yeah. Well, look, I, there are a lot of reasons to talk to your animal. Some of them have nothing to do with your animal knowing what you're talking about. Sure, um, of course. Um, but uh, you got to practice your speech on them sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think giving voice to what they might be thinking is a useful exercise. Oh, it's wonderful. Um, yes. But um, I had another point, and I've now. <laughs> Maddie, do you remember? <laughs> she. Yeah. Um, oh, the other thing I was going to say is it doesn't necessarily have anything whatsoever to do with what people think. In fact, to the extent okay. that dogs do get it, and they do, they get a lot of human language. They don't necessarily know what you mean, but they, they interpret a lot of stuff. Mm -hmm. To the extent that that's true, they may be, in effect, training you. In other words, to the extent that you exaggerate your meaning when you're talking to your dog, the dog may be more successful at doing what you want it to do. Mm -hmm. And so you would become inadvertently trained to do that, whereas your cat, because it doesn't do what you want it to do, does not train you to alter your modulation. Oh, I th well, I think you're conflating two things there. Like, can they, un you know, are they getting you to effectively slow down, slow down and hyperarticulate and all of this, in order that they can learn more about how to understand you so that they can do what you want? So there's a, do I understand you and will I do what you want question. And we have to separate those because the cat's not going to do what you want. Right. Right. But does a cat understand you? That's the, that's the question we're trying to tease apart here. And it's, it is harder because you can't basically do like a, a, like just, just run this maze for me. And like a dog might look at you funny, be like, why would I do that? But okay. And a cat's like, no. I'm not, I'm not going to. Right, it could understand completely what you want, and it yeah. would affect its behavior, not at all. Yeah, so, you, so you're going to need to be a little clever in your design of, of how you can figure out if, um, <clears throat> if your animal is responding to you. And we know from a lot of previous research that, yes, uh, infants are responding and learning from adult language the more, the older they get. Dogs are responding to human language too, to a remarkable idea, but to a remarkable degree rather. But what about cats? It hasn't been looked at, in part perhaps because they don't feel like uh, collaborating. And so, like, how would you know? So, this new paper, uh, again, really small study. Uh, the methods quote 19 cats were recruited to the study. Out of them, 16 cats, parentheses, nine males and seven females, completed the whole study, end quote. I'm like, what, the other cats have better things to do? <laughs> what happened? <laughs> but, yeah, okay. Okay, so three okay, cats so were like, I don't think so. I don't think so. So it's a tiny little study. It's also, it's indoor cats. They're living with vet students in studio apartments. Okay, so mm. it's really narrow in terms of what kind of cats are being asked to, um, to, to basically respond either to... to Four kinds of speech, I guess it's going to have been. And I, I was paying more attention to the other one, but I think it was um, owner speech to other people, owner speech to directed at cats, stranger speech to other people, like just ambient speech, and stranger speech directed at the cat. So we, you know, the cat is hearing four different kinds of voices, um, two of uh, two different humans, 
um, one human whom they know well, and two different situations of the humans talking, one in which they're just talking not to the cat at all, and one in which they're talking to, um, to the cat. And the only one of those four situations, there was one situation in which the cats responded, and it was, of course, the one in which the owner is talking to the cat. Mm -hmm. And they do show a response. So, okay, small, 16 cats, again, three had something else to do. Um, indoor cats, living, you know, with vet students, all of this. But they did find um, that cats actually responded uh, noticeably to owners talking to cats, but not in any of the, not human voices in any of the other situations. Interesting if true. Okay. I actually, I believe that. Yeah. Um, so, you know, cats discriminate. So the conclusion, again, small study, is that hum that cats do discriminate between human speech um, that is ambient and human speech that is directed to them, but only when it's from a person who they know. And and you know, I'd love to see if, like, you know, from our situation where our cats have four people who they know really well, and other people, um, I I think absolutely our cats respond to our voices and not to some random person who comes and is like, hey, kitty, and be like, what? No, I'm not. You got kibble, but right. Um, but then I also wanted to share. A 2002 paper that's really ridiculous in terms of the method. So I have to walk us through that first. But um, because the conclusion is so fantastic, um, I hope it holds up if ever the right study is done. Uh, so what was done is they've got undergraduate psych students interacting with a cat whose real name the psych students don't know. They've been given a fake name, so the cat can't respond to its name being used. It's kind of funny, okay? Um, engaging how human speech and also human feelings about cats affect how the humans uh, will interact with them. And so they're not, they're just given some like toys, some enrichment stuff. They're t they can't touch the cat. And so that's also like some cats will be like, yeah, touch me. Like, oh, you, you're not gonna touch me? What am I, why am I paying any attention to you, right? Um, but the study was trying to get at, like, what what is a person's opinion about whether or not they like cats? Does that affect whether or not the cat is interacting with them? And also, what kinds of things that people might say to cats gets cats to interact with them? And in this case, it's all strangers. The, the dramatic failing of this study is that they literally used one cat. <laughs> so, like, they got one cat who's, let me see... Um, I can't remember what the cat's actual name is, but the cat was going by whiskers in the study, okay? <laughs> and, uh, wait, no, I do have it. I have it highlighted here. Let me see if I can find it. Sorry, guys. Oh, here, here we go. Um, in the methods under feline confederate, a two-year, four-month-old female gray tortoiseshell cat served in the study. She was unfamiliar to all of the participants. Although the cat actually was named Tabitha, she was referred to as whiskers throughout the study to ensure that her responses were not based on hearing her real name. It was also thought that using a gender-neutral name would help reduce gender-based expectations of the cat's behavior. Okay, that's all fine, <laughs> except like one cat. Right. <laughs> like, like, you can't do this with one cat because cats are singular, cats have personalities. We have no idea if the results of this study are because Whiskers, no, Tabitha, had particular feelings about particular kinds of humans because probably she did. So all of that is to say, I have no idea if this will hold up, but the results of this study were twofold. One is not very surprising. Um, women who self-report that they like cats are more likely to have cats unknown to them choose to spend time with them. Okay. Whereas men who self-report that they like cats were not better able to attract Tabitha <laughs> to them. It's not really cats. It's, it's not. More like it's not cats. cats. It's not cats at all. Uh, and uh, again, it's you know undergrad. It's undergraduate psych students, right? So it, you know it's this very narrow piece of piece of reality. Um, but cats, cat, are less are. I, I see, I insist on using the plural because they did too until I went back and carefully read the methods. Like, no, it's not a cat's situation. <laughs> it's really not. But okay, cat is less likely to approach strange men whose speech has a high degree of imperatives, like come here and don't do that, <laughs> which is to say my... <laughs> My conclusion, the way that I would phrase that, and they didn't, is cats avoid strange men who give orders. <laughs> <laughs> and really, shouldn't we all? So cat, cat, Tabitha, <laughs> representing all cats, and I would say maybe should be representing like all mammals, avoid strange men who give orders. And maybe if we all just kind of like started there and went like, okay, let's just figure out if I can know you better before I accept your imperatives to come here and do that, <laughs> then... 
then we could maybe accomplish more in the world. Yeah, yeah, that makes that makes a lot yeah. of sense. Yeah. Um, so that's 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 all I got. <laughs> so should this ever be done with multiple cats? <laughs> more than one Tabitha. More than one Tabitha that you're hoping that result will hold up. Yeah. Yeah. I, I did they they didn't correct for whether men were more likely to give orders? I mean, they had imperatives being given by both women and, they did. and men. Yeah. At equal levels. Yeah. Okay. I don't think it was equal. You know, they didn't go, they did not, um, they did not tell the human, they didn't call them confederates, human participants, human participants in advance, what kinds of ways to interact with, with whiskers. Um, they just let them interact, but there were, um, so what they found, I think, um, and there were also there were cat owners and non-cat owners among them. There were men and women among them. Um, somehow it was only male participants who data whose data had to be deleted. We don't we aren't told why. <laughs> um, but uh, there were imperatives uh, that were given by women and the cats, the cat, to not <laughs> preferentially avoid the women giving orders, just the men, the strange men giving well, orders. Well, that's interesting. I. Uh... I admit that in addition to the male-female comparison, I'm also interested in within males, uh, totally. Canadian and not Canadian. <laughs> you know, because I'm imagining that Canadian males are not that great at giving orders, except for Justin Trudeau, mm. who seems to be an exception, though he may be Cuban. <laughs> <laughs> I think we're done. <laughs> I All think right. that's excellent. Yes. Okay. <laughs> so someone points out that we should take Tabitha's perspective and apply it to Koji as a strange man giving orders. Yes. Oh. So exactly. If yes. we could let, you know, Tabitha may have the wisdom of her generation. Now, this is from 2002. Tabitha is probably, unfortunately, no longer with us. Uh, but I imagine that we could find a Tabitha for 2022 and find uh, that avoiding strange men who give orders is in fact not the best way forward either through a pandemic or not mm, that's right and it, especially with all the lockdowns tabitha too may have grokked that in fact taking such orders is really not a good thing really not a good idea yeah, yeah. all yeah. right so uh maybe i would i imagine that i will go a little bit deeper into the uh Infant directed speech, dog directed speech, cat directed speech literature, and I think there's just not very much in the cat directed speech literature. Hence, this being sort of the best that I could find. But um, I, I'm I'm pleased that I feel I think that you were already there, but I feel like I've pulled you a little bit towards my position on the question only by being explicit about like do cats understand? You know, do do cats understand that they are being spoken to? when it is by someone whom they know. And uh, you know that, that first paper that was better done than this 2002 paper, the, the one that was just published last year, uh, suggested yes, but it was very small. I think that, I think that result will hold up. Well, I, look, I don't have any doubt about this, actually. Yeah. I mean, you know uh, that I, uh, when I need to find the cat for the feeding, yes. um, that I whistle, and that mm -hmm. by whistling prior which, to feeding. Which you've never referred to either of the hymns as the cat. The cat. Yeah. Um, <laughs> But uh, that by whistling before feeding, the whistling then produces the cat because the cat wants to eat. And so it, an inadvertent version of this undoubtedly happens because mm -hmm. a person talking to other people in the environment of the cat does not suggest that food is about to happen. But a person talking to the cat probably perceives the cat getting fed fairly frequently. And so it wouldn't be surprising if the animal had detected that there was something about that kind of speech True. that means I should yeah. hang around the kitchen and... Um, and talking about carne asada does not bring out the cat, but bringing the carne asada out of the refrigerator does bring out the does cat. Does bring out the cat for mm -hmm. many comprehensible reasons. So yes, I just don't think the cat has any idea what the hell we're talking about, even when we are talking about the cat. Well, at the moment he's sleeping, so yes, it's, not a fair, he it's not a fair question. 